Hey guys, you're listening to episode 258 of The Modern Acre. This week we talked to Chris Kirsten, who's the co-CEO of Land and Market. Chris ranched full-time for over 10 years before joining the Savory Institute. With a long-standing passion for regenerative agriculture and better food distribution systems, Chris has dedicated his life to helping and connect ranchers with consumers in ways that create synergistic value for both sides. You're listening to the Modern Acre Podcast. Every week, you'll hear from the entrepreneurs, innovators, and leaders that are changing the food and agricultural industry on and off the farm. Your hosts are Tim and Tyler Nuss. They are brothers, fifth-generation farmers, and entrepreneurs who have scaled tech startups, developed international supply chains, and built brands. The Modern Acre is ag built different. Tim, I'm really excited about this interview with Chris and just everything that Land and Market is doing. It's it's a topic we we mention on the podcast so much. It's you know how do you define regenerative agriculture? How do you track it? So I'm excited to dig in this conversation. Tim, you know another topic of conversation that comes up on this podcast quite often. It's your San Francisco 49ers. Woo. Playoffs, baby, we're here. Oh man, I am excited. Tim, we were talking off air about the Niners, this roster. We feel like it, 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 we kind of went through everything. We feel like this team is actually a, a, a much more complete team than our Super Bowl run in 2019. I know, pretty crazy, like very well-rounded team. We're like heating up at the right time. Everybody's getting hot. We're getting guys back off injury. So really looking forward to the game this weekend. We're playing the Seahawks, an in-division rival. So it'll be interesting. We've play them often. So it's kind of the, the devil, you know, so I'm kind of liking where we're at right now, heading into the playoffs. Tim, we go into the game. Ooh, I think we'll, I think we'll save it for the divisional round tie. Yeah. We'll, or, we'll or, or conference championship or maybe we'll go to Arizona in February. Who knows? Ooh. Well, speaking of, I think I know a way to pay for that. Sports betting is, is illegal in California. So, you know, if you were to bet on something like that, you know, the odds for a 49ers Chargers Super Bowl. So my wife is a Chargers fan. And I think Chargers are actually heating up and getting hot at the right time, despite kind of a weird clunky week 18 game this weekend. The The odds for a 49ers Chargers Super Bowl would pay out $100 would pay out about four or five grand. So I'm like, maybe put a little action on a 49ers Chargers Super Bowl. If that happens, it's going to cause some tension with my wife. But if we make a lot of money in the process, that could help smooth things over. That could help smooth things over. Not gambling or investment advice here at the Modern Acre, but I like what like where your head's at, Ty. Never, never, never on the Modern Acre podcast. So um, no, we're super excited about it. But guys, that's that's enough of 49er talk. We want to jump into this interview with Chris. This was a an awesome conversation, really insightful. I think you guys are going to get a ton out of this. I know I did during the interview. So without further ado, let's jump in. Chris, great to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Tyler. Excited to be here. Yeah, we're excited to talk to you and learn more about your background and work with Land and Market. But before we jump in, what's top of mind for you, Chris? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that kind of kind of keeps me up at night lately is this this juxtaposition of the the carbon markets and you know, my whole shtick in life is I want farmers to get um, elevated in their role in society. So, so if we as a civilization are kind of collectively coming to this conclusion that the soil is at least part of the solution, and sometimes it's it's the whole solution to so many of the ills in society, whether that's climate change, world hunger, uh, you know, lack of water, struggling rural economies we're seeing the soil as a nexus between all of these things. It's a huge component of these major issues that we haven't had solutions for. Then, then really that puts the farmer as the ambassador to that solution. That really puts them front and center um, as society's liaison to steward that. Um, and that's great. So I, I, I want to see farmers get paid like doctors and lawyers. That's, that's kind of my goal in life is to get to that level. Um, the carbon markets are a mechanism to do that. The challenge is that the current opportunity is a little bit like the Wild West and and the science is still figuring a lot out. It's still really uh, a new frontier. You know, and, and people have said, we know more about the surface of the moon than we know about soil biology uh, and how that works. And so, um, 
it's a weird time right now where it's like, ooh, am I am I selling too early? Am I selling smoke? And you know, is it, how does this all work? You know, a lot of times I'll talk about sometimes it, it it feels like trying to manage for soil carbon alone in a vacuum as a single variable is a little bit like trying to manage the hydrogen in a glass of water. Like it's really important the hydrogen's there. It's it's really important to the the larger global picture of what we're talking about, but managing for it in a vacuum almost impossible to do. Um, and so that's that's kind of where we at we're at with carbon. I'd like us to see us get to a a broader suite of ecosystem service credits uh, to where you're looking at carbon, water, and biodiversity lumped together as one because they're all really windows into the same room. Uh, when we look at when we look at how soil carbon is starting to emerge, it's it's really following what forestry credits did. And forestry credits are a little bit like a like the bond market. Like they're really stable. It's like, hey, there wasn't a forest here before we planted some trees. The trees are growing. It's a very linear, predictable rate about how you're gonna get that carbon and what you're gonna achieve over time. Versus when you're talking carbon in the soil, it's a little bit more like like looking at GDP. You have like momentum markers that you're looking at, but it's a very complex entire economy of carbon trading going on below the soil. And so it's hard to just look at a single molecule of carbon and trend that in a linear way over time. And so that's what science is trying to grapple with while the markets are just kind of like going wild and crazy at the same time. Um and I'm, I'm, I'm ready for a reckoning to that and for that to kind of like come into this new paradigm shift and in, into its new existence and have a little bit more stability there and have that mechanism where farmers can get paid for the great work that they're doing. Wow, that's that's awesome. I, I I've been thinking about some you know eloquent response to to that overview, but I don't think I can do that justice. I think that was super helpful um, and really a picture of of where we're at right now and the complexities and the challenges of of some of the things that you mentioned. So I'll I'll leave that be because that was I, I think that stands alone, and I appreciate that that overview is really helpful. Uh, so, Chris, let's let's take a step back, um, learn a little bit more about you. What ultimately uh, led you to agriculture? Sure. So, I'm, I'm Chris Kirsten. I'm the co CEO of a program called Land to Market. But prior to that, I was a I was a full time farmer. So, I spent first 12, 15 years of my career full time farming, predominantly in animal agriculture. But I did work a lot in in orchard crops as well, uh, olives for olive oil, and a little bit for canning, uh, stone fruit, citrus. Um, and so about 10 years ago, I worked at a place here in Northern California. I live outside of uh, Chico area uh, and I helped manage a farm that was early on in integrating livestock into orchards. So this, um, this kind of, um, you know, synergy that you get from putting plants and animals together. Everybody in society right now wants to pull those two apart. It's plant-based, it's animal-based, it's carnivore, it's vegan, uh, and we were all about putting those two together because in, in nature, you always see plants and animals working together in harmony. Uh, and so we started putting livestock in our orchards and cut our fuel usage by 85 uh, percent. Our, our measurable bricks on our on our um, our stone fruits went way up. Um, and so basically the sheep and the cows did the mowing. The goats handled the invasive weeds. Chickens debugged and fertilized. Um, and it, it worked really, really well. There were some things to figure out there, a lot of innovation that happened, but uh, it was super cool. Uh, and then we started uh, direct marketing pretty early on. We were, uh, I don't know, mid-aughts. We're, we're selling a lot online. Uh, we're going to eight farmers markets a week. We had buyers clubs. You know, We were going, shipping all over the state. Um, really early in that connecting with with consumers on shared values. I did a lot of work on regional supply chain development and kind of finding gaps in there between local processors that, you know, either only focus on a single item or only work with the biggest of players and trying to kind of break through some of those components uh, and make that more available for a larger community. Uh, about 10 years ago, I joined the Savory Institute. Uh, Savory Institute has been focused on um, saving the world's grasslands uh, and really this this kind of like, it's very polarized in the modern zeitgeist, but um, this this synergy between grazers and grasslands. And I think society has kind of pitted those two against each other, that like all grazing is always bad for the environment. It's very dogmatic. Uh, but if that was if that was true, like these grazing animals wouldn't still be here today. There has to be some connection between them to where they enhance each other. Otherwise, one would be gone by the wayside. Uh, and so we really focus at the Sabre Institute at looking at that connection and, and really 
from a biological perspective, not so much even just a, a farming one, but from a biological perspective, how can we maximize that to create net positive outcomes for the environment? And so that that was started by Alan Savory, who's a person. We're not a catering company. Alan Savory did a TED Talk in like 2011 that kind of blew up and went viral early on. It's got millions and millions of views now. And it's all about this idea that stewarding animal agriculture correctly can be a huge solution to these problems. And going back to that soil is the nexus, you can work in a really intact ecosystem and, and create these net positive outcomes. And there's a huge percentage of the world doing this. And that story is not really getting told. And so that was a huge part of our focus. We, we set up these field offices around the world. We call them Savory Hubs. They're, they're independently owned and operated, but they, they take the work of Alan Savory and they deliver it in the context of their region. And so the socioeconomic political context of that region, they take it to the farmers there. Um, so help set up that, that early hub network at Savory and get that going. And then we started getting approached by brands and brands were like, Hey, you know, you're working with, uh, tens of millions of hectares globally. You're teaching people how to create these net positive outcomes. You're digging into the science of like what makes that all tick. How could we start tapping onto you as like a, like a supply chain solution? And we were like, no, 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 no. Like we do, we do training and, and farmer support. Like that's it. Our B2B really stops at that wall of like the farmer. We're not really worried about playing in the rest of the chain. And for a long time, that's what we saw as like the nexus of what was going to save civilization is, is focusing on that farmer piece. And, and, and the brands in some ways kind of convinced us. I went a little bit kind of like kicking and screaming into that arena, but it was like, Society is not going to make it if business to steal straight up from B Corp right now. Like if business isn't acting as a force for good, that's their little tagline. We're not going to make it. And it was like, yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, from a from a resource perspective, we really need that. And so we started to look at the opportunity to collaborate more with the marketplace and what that would look like. And that's when we formed Land to Market. So Land to Market was this idea of what if we connected those that were that were doing the right thing, that were healing their land. Uh, and helped them overhaul supply chains to create traceability back to farm, which was like unheard of at the time. Brands had literally spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to tackle traceability in a better way. And we were like, wait a minute, you've spent all this money reaching back in your supply chain. We start with the farmers and can reach forward and we can meet in the middle. And so that was like a big unlock for us. Um, so we said, hey, we don't really want like the fact that you've taken training to be the the decider of whether or not somebody's getting net positive results, if we're going to tackle this, this bigger issue of what is regenerative, we've got to dig into what that really means. And so for us, regenerative truly means net positive and it means net positive to yourself. We're a little bit in a place right now where the world's maybe trying to massage that term or redefine it to mean regenerative is just you're better than somebody else. And so everybody's in this kind of like looking at like, no, no, someone's worse than me. So I must be net positive, which is kind of where we were before just under rebranding because there's always somebody worse than you. There's always somebody better than you. The whole thing is a journey. Uh, and so our thing is about continuous improvement of yourself, of your own operation generationally and healing that landscape over time. So we had to we had to launch a scientific protocol to be able to measure those outcomes. And so we launched this protocol called Ecological Outcome Verification. We call it EOV for short, but it's it's very on the nose. It's like measuring the outcomes of what happens with the ecology, trending them over time, using that trending tool as a way to, to, to get producers to optimize management. That's the big unlock. We're not trying to be the police of regenerative to chastise, you know, these are the good actors, these are the bad actors. But again, go back to that journey approach and say, what do we see in the data here? How can we use that as an optimization tool for management so that we're constantly refining and iterating as we go along? And so that's that's kind of like the the genesis story of how it all came together. We now work with with brands all over the globe. We have hundreds of brand partners. Uh, we've over a thousand products in the marketplace have actually been verified. We launched a, a seal that actually shows up on package uh, for for companies that say, "Hey, we're going to source." that material for our product or that ingredient for our product and, and put it into this good and sell it to consumers. The consumer can actually see, hey, this came from land bases that are healing, that, that they're being stewarded in the right way. 
And again, as I said before, there's a, there's a much more than a critical mass of that happening around the globe. And that story just wasn't getting told well. And so we're like, let's put hard empirical data behind it and let's go facilitate that and create this traceability in the supply chain uh, in partnership with brands uh, and allow consumers to really to really vote with their dollar in a way they haven't been able to do from an environmental standpoint before. It's like there was lots of good programs out there, but none of them really implicitly spoke to improving environmental health over time. Uh, and so, so we're trying to unlock that for consumers to create that food and fiber democracy that we all dreamed of. So I'll pause there, but that's, that's a little bit about myself and where I'm at and where we're going. No, thanks. Thanks for that overview and background. Just amazing stuff. I think there's a million different ways Ty and I could take this. Both of us were nodding as you were walking us through, through that part of the conversation. I think just the way that you're thinking about regenerative and framing the conversation specific to the farmer makes a ton of sense of net positive for their specific context for some broad definition that is across different geographies and crop mixes and, and cultures. So I think that's super interesting. I really want to talk about the growth that you've seen, Chris. Like you've been able to build this pretty quickly. Like you mentioned, hundreds of brands, tons of farmer partners. That's a lot of hyper growth in a business that typically doesn't move super quickly. So how have you been going about like aligning with both brands and farms to grow the platform? Yeah, that's, I mean, we talk about it of like yoking the horses is kind of our internal analogy that we use. And, and that's, that's the name of the game. So, so um, I'm co-CEO of this land to market program. Uh, when I started, it was it was me and my business partner, David Rizzo, that were kind of spearheading this inside of Savory Institute. It's kind of a strategic business unit. That that entity has now spun out and become its own company. It's still owned by Savory Institute, but we we are out there looking for investment, and that didn't work in the 501c3. So we're looking for the right partners to kind of come along and take us uh, further on the journey to accelerate things. And then the, the team, like I said, it was just the two of us. There's now 12 of us. So in the course of about... 24 months, we've seen these multiple periods where we've doubled the size of the team. And so now building a culture around that, uh, getting all the processes in place to help in, in, engender a culture, but then also the processes and procedures of how we do all this stuff, of stuff that three years ago, no one was doing, four years ago, no one was doing, that we're really creating something as we go along. Keeping up with the growth and trying to have it not be a flash in the pan, something trendy and cool for a moment, but that has legs that will last for decades, uh, you're spot on. That, that, that's the name of the game. That's what we're trying to uh, create is a long-term journey to get brands excited in this moment right now where, you know, in some ways, I I, I wasn't sure we were going to get this far in my lifetime. You know, it's like, it like you, you look at, we're working with the world's biggest companies and, and a lot of small startups. We work with both. We work with some that like, they've never had a purchase order before, but it's in their DNA as a company to do the right thing. And then we work with these huge companies that are like, whoa, we were some of the, some of these like C-suite executives have told me straight up, we are a massive part of the problem. Our business model is extractive at its core. And if we don't change, the ship's going to sink. And so to work with both of those as a juxtaposition and hold space for both of those um, is also very interesting. But there's this moment of time where all of a sudden there was this like tipping point, collective awakening, whatever you want to call it. All of these folks kind of woke up at the same time as like, whoa, it's about soil. I can't just do this offset strategy anymore of like put solar panels on the factory or, you know, better LED lights in the store. I'm going to change this little one tweak in my packaging and now I'm good to go. Really have to look at this systemically. I have to change the way I do business. Um, and when that moment hit, we struck while the iron was hot. I spent about three years taking on average 70 flights a year showing up to, to any C-suite that was that would really listen um, and saying, you know, we as a society aren't going to make it if we don't do this collectively. And so how do we how do we like roll up our, our sleeves? I don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers, but I know we're better together. And so that was kind of our pitch of just like, let's figure this out as a collective and do this together and do what no one's done before. And we just started making little progress. It's like, crawling out of the ditch, clawing your way up like one little piece of, um, of progress at a time. But every time we get that progress, there's a huge unlock. And so like one of the things that surprised us is, you know, most of us come from, from the agriculture space. Think about food. Food's like our primary thing that we think about. That's the industry we serve. Over half of the work we do at Land to Market now is in apparel. 
uh, apparel had no answers for these things. There, there some, I thought like coming from like chill chain logistics and food safety and HACCP plans is like, we have the most complex supply chains in the world. Holy smokes. I started looking at some of these global supply chains for fibers, uh, you know, leather in particular goes around the world, like two or three times uh, before in, in like 20 stops on a supply chain between intermediaries, brokers, three stages of tanning uh, before it even goes to like what we would think of as like a co-manufacturer. And then, and then very few brands are making cornerstone items that it's like, oh, this is our thing that we make year after year after year. So then next year, we don't even know if we're going to make that item again. So very challenging supply chains. And we had no idea the unlock we were bringing to them and to that industry. Uh, it's like you think of a... a you know, whatever your quintessential leather company is, you know, that makes a nice handbag, accessories, things like that. Animal agriculture is core to what they do. And they don't really have answers to this when everybody says all animal agriculture is always bad all the time. Um, and their whole business identity, their entire IP is around creating these high quality, durable goods, but they don't know anything about farming. So like early on, we worked with this, this caring group, which owns Gucci, Balenciaga, St. Laurent. They own like a, like a dozen luxury apparel brands and they're based in Paris. And they did a life cycle assessment is what they called. I might say LCA uh, for short, but they did this life cycle assessment, but they did it on this much broader scale. They didn't look at just carbon. They looked at greenhouse gas emissions. They looked at land use, water use. There was a matrix of about six or seven things that they looked at. And they measured the impact for each of those things. And what they found is that most of that happens at the beginning at raw material sourcing. Most of that happens at the farm and they don't know anything about farms. And so this was kind of that one of those like early like tide shifts where everybody was like, oh, like we have to focus on the supply chain, but we have to focus it all the way back to the farmer. And that's, that's actually an opportunity for us not not something that we should be afraid of. So that's that's kind of been how things have kicked off. But now we work with, like I said, I mentioned Caring Group, but we work with like Burberry. We work with New Balance. We work with UGG. Uh, we have a huge project going on right now with UGG. UGG and Deckers. Deckers is their parent company. They came to us and said, you know, most of our sourcing happens in Australia. We want to start with leather supply you have coming through the program. We want to make an innovative product. And then, and then we want to help heal a million acres of land in Australia. And so they put in money for farmer scholarships, for training, for EOV work. Uh, and then our land to market team works on creating that traceability of products coming off of those farms that are getting the net positive results and going through from there. You know, we work with Madewell and J. Crew. You know, the, the list of brands is pretty massive. And then on the food side, we're working with, you know, like I said, big and small. And I guess it's on apparel too. Lots of startups. Sometimes it'll be a designer that's like, hey, I've got this new idea, this new thing. I want to bake this in from the beginning. And it's really fun to do all that. So, but the scaling is the most challenging part of how do you grow it? How do you hold the core? How do you make sure no one grabs the wheel and kind of steers it away into something else and really make the change that we all set out to do? Chris, let's let's dig in on EOV for a little bit, right? It's it's a it's a topic of conversation we have on this podcast quite often is is how do you define regenerative? How do you track and verify regenerative? Um, and one of the, one of the big challenges, right, is because um, there there are so many different contexts, right? The the Gabe Browns of the world that have kind of under that have demonstrated a blueprint for regenerative in their context. That's great, right? Like we need more of those, but we don't necessarily have that blueprint for every context. Um, so, so talk to us about how how you how you think about defining and tracking and verifying regenerative agriculture. What what areas you focus on, and and maybe if you want to even speak to organic and what organic has done right, and maybe maybe gone wrong or could be better at, and what you guys tried to to focus and emphasize. Yeah, I think, and and you know, this isn't a shot at at any individual organization, individual you know that you mentioned or didn't mention. I think it's just the nature of humanity, and I truly mean that, including myself, is reductionist. Like, like by nature, we are trying to say, well, there's all sorts of chaos out there. How do we simplify that to the, the easiest thing that I can understand and the fewest number of variables that I can keep track of? And I think when we do that, we lose lots of, of, of the nuance, lots of the noise, and there's value in that noise. And so everybody out there has been trying to create, you know, I sometimes joke, you see it on the cover of magazines, you know, that 
the, the 10 steps to flatter abs or whatever it might be, you know, and it's like everybody's trying to boil down that recipe. Here's, here's the 10 steps. And, and the reality is I think we find in most of our soft sciences, whether that's governance, management, uh, human health, how we manage nature, uh, there, there, there isn't a recipe. The context really matters. The nuance, that noise really matters. And so uh, the, the kind of general policy that we've seen from humans for, for the last at least <clears throat> 200 years for, for agriculture has been, let's have these universities do a study, try to measure for one variable in one ecoregion of the planet and get to statistical relevance in that one ecoregion on that one variable and then tell everybody that's how you should be doing it. Which what that looks like is, you know, we might try to identify a singular best management practice for a singular uh, outcome in Vermont and then be telling farmers in Nevada, this is what you should be doing. Uh, and I think we see all sorts of problems with that. And when you say it like that, it makes sense. When you look at it from a 30,000 foot level, it makes sense. And so our thing is, what are the principles that we want to look at here? What are the principles of nature? What are the principles of organizations? What are the principles of society that we want to hold on to? How can everybody build their own bespoke plan that makes sense for their larger context? Even if we had a best management practice that we knew worked for this ecoregion, it may not be the right implementation strategy for two neighbors. Because as soon as you get outside of that single plane of agriculture, as soon as you zoom outside of that, it's like, wait a minute, they have different goals for their life, different resources available to them, different amounts of money in the bank. You know, one may have a $400,000 tractor and can get, you know, compost from their, their sister who's a dairy farmer, um, can get manu compost and manure, no problem. The other might not have a tricycle and is trying to rub two nickels together and send their kids to college. You know, spreading compost over 10,000 acres may not make sense for them right then for their context. Um, not, to, not to say that the best management practice isn't proven and sound, doesn't always fit the context. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to unlock and pull apart is we're not looking for that, that silver bullet, that panacea that it's like, oh, this massive data set, we're looking at regenerative around the world. We're going to come with this unlock and be able to share that with the world. We're really trying to share with the world that that context really matters and that creating a bespoke plan is really important to that. We kind of have to start there, that your context is going to be different than your neighbor's regardless of how similar you look from an agrarian operation, the context is still drastically different, which means you need your own plan that works for you. And so that's kind of where we start. And we get that at a business level. When you, when you talk about businesses, nobody goes to business school and comes out with like, here's the 10 steps to create a budget for a $10 million company. We all know in that scenario, we've already like metabolized this idea that that having a custom plan there makes sense. So we're trying to do the same thing for agriculture, kind of bring that same awakening. So EOV was designed to look at uh, the environment as a whole. Let's bring in more of that noise. So we're not looking at the single variable like carbon alone or water alone. We're looking at soil health. We're looking at carbon. We're looking at water. We're looking at biodiversity. And, and I think I said this in the beginning, they're all windows into the same room. And so when plants photosynthesize, they pull carbon out of the atmosphere they store it in their, in their root system below ground, uh, other than trees, which mostly store it in their trunk. But most other plants store it below ground, uh, and particularly grasses do. Um, and now we're creating these humates in the soil. This is your soil organic matter. These are your smallest particles in the soil. They hold on to the most water. They have the most surface area. Uh, they hold on to the most water, and they hold on to it for longer. When you have more water in an ecosystem, you create more production, more biodiversity. So they're all looking in at the same thing. And so while the whole world is like kind of my opener, they're all trying to figure out this carbon thing and they want this really clean, linear, straight line. We're kind of saying like that line might look more like a stock ticker. It might go up and down, but we're, we're normalizing that data set because we're bringing in other corollary data sets with it. We're bringing in the water. We're bringing in the biodiversity. We're looking together at it as a whole. So we think that kind of helps that optimization helps farmers really see what's working in their management, what's not. What are the leading indicators and what are the lagging indicators? So like a leading indicator, uh, well, let's start with a lagging indicator because we've already talked about it. Like, like carbon is a lagging indicator. It takes time to build. It's also very expensive to measure. There's lots of noise in that as we're trying to like, as a society, prove those models out. Um, but that's a lagging indicator. It has value to the marketplace, but managing for carbon, like I said, very challenging if possible at all for the farmer to do. But a leading indicator is something like 
how quickly your dead plant material is breaking down into the soil. That's telling you the metabolism of your landscape, how quickly that can break it down. Um, how quickly dung is breaking down. If you have animals in that system is another one that's telling you the metabolism of your ecosystem. So an EOB, we break them into two categories. These are lagging indicators. These are leading indicators. The leading indicators have more value for the producer to optimize that management. So you, you, you mentioned comparing the like um, organic. Uh, organic was great, but organic is, is practice-based. And it's a different thing. It's telling consumers, we've identified... Uh, chemicals that we don't want used, and those are prohibited in this system. Uh, and it's a real practice base, do or do not. Like, that's it. Like, you just follow the program and, and you're either in or out. It's pretty binary. We, on the other hand, and like when you go through that process, you don't know anything more about your farm at the end of the day, at the end of the inspection than you did at the beginning. We, on the other hand, are trying to create this, this, this broad suite of dashboard analytics that a farmer can come in and say, oh, I tried this. And I got this outcome. You guys talked about piloting different things on your own farm. You know, I've heard you guys mention that on the podcast of like, these are different things we're trying over here and we're trying over there. Okay, now what if you had a dashboard of analytics that was standardized around the globe and you could see, okay, when I tried this, this was my outcome. What if I tweak this? What if I tweak that? When I tried this, this is my outcome. And it allows you to double down on what you see signs for wor are working and, and pivot away from things that clearly don't have legs um, and don't require further testing. So that's what we're trying to create with EOV. When you start to get into now it's a, a market certification and a, um, a, a product differentiation scheme, we're really showing the world, we're showing the consumer these products are coming from places that have done that due diligence, that have done the work, that are creating these net positive results. We have that empirical data behind it. And now you can shop fairly blindfolded. You don't need to know a word like carbon sequestration, but you can know when you see this seal, it means the environment's healing. It means that land is healing. It means that the land is being stewarded correctly. And so that's what we're, that's what we're trying to create. So the EOV is a huge component of that. And getting that right is a is a it's ongoing journey of iterating on that process to say what can we learn and how we measure um, to create further optimization for the farmer and further security for the consumer that people are doing things right and we're getting those net positive outcomes. That makes a lot of sense, Chris. As we kind of wrap up the section, wanted to get into the messy middle and talk supply chain a bit. We've talked a lot about brands and farms. You mentioned just the leather supply chain alone, twenty different stops along that supply chain. Um, a lot of farmers are producing, you know, commodities like we're growing tomatoes for processing and the, the forms of products that consumer brands are typically buying are not the, the typical farm output. So it's going to some kind of aggregator processor to go from a commodity into a usable good for food products and apparel products. How do you kind of address that, that disconnect or challenge that a lot of farmers have that if you do have kind of a small to medium sized farm and you're trying to talk directly this, with these brands, you're often talking like a different language in terms of what they want to buy versus what you're producing on farm. And it's really going to have to go through some intermediary. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. He's talking about talking about a different language. I was on a early call like four or five years ago and we were trying to facilitate this, this deal going down and, and, and the, the kind of the stock keeping unit or the lowest common denominator was people were talking about truckloads of product. And so I realized pretty quickly the farmer was talking about truckloads of live animals and the buyer was talking about truckloads of meat and they were completely talking past each other and had no idea because they're not used to being in those conversations. And so to, to, it, the analogy holds true for cropping, but I'll just kind of keep it on ar animal agriculture for a minute because that's, that's kind of the majority of our bailiwick right now. Farmers sell live animals. And, and brands and company buy specific parts and pieces. And often those parts and pieces have already been, been processed or finished in a way to make it usable for their needs as a manufacturer. And so for like a decade, as this whole movement was burgeoning and there was all this kind of energy pent up about let's do things better, almost on a, like a weekly basis, I would hear from brand companies being like, there's no farmers out there producing either at scale or on the values that we want or need for our consumers. And then from farmers would be like, there's no brands out there buying on the values and at the scale for what I'm producing. And it was like, the whole unlock is that middle. It was all supply chain. So from day one, land to market has been focused on, okay, the unlock is in the supply chain. And like, and that's where I say, like, when we're like, 
clawing our way through. It's it's mostly on creating those little iterations there um, that allow us to kind of get to the next stage, the next act of the play, if you will. And so a, a really good example of that was, was Timberland. Timberland has been an early mover on a lot of fronts. Um, and they were working with a group, some friends of ours, other half processing that was addressing some of the the like traceability at the tannery level. And it's it's just two brothers, two guys that were like, we're just going to like broker skins. We're going to go in. We, that's not our background, but these are like usually generational businesses. They're like, no, no, we're just going to go in and like buy skins and like get them to the right place and like put our own money up front for that. Like it was amazing. So they started working in Timberland and, and OHP was like, other half processing was like, okay, you got you to gotta work with these land to market guys because they've got this huge network of farmers. And so Timberland was like, we want to buy direct from the farms. We want to honor the farm for the work that they're doing. And we're going to create with, with land to market and OHP, we're going to create a micro supply chain. We're not making 20 stops around the world. We're not going 40 to 60,000 miles around the globe. We're going to go in and, and build a supply chain and kind of brute force this thing as a proof of concept. And so they came to us and, and we said, okay, we've, we've got 50 farms in Minnesota that we want to connect you with. Uh, they already have net positive EOV scores and they're part of a meat company, uh, it's a Thousand Hills Grazed, uh, that's never sold their hides before. They don't have a leather program. Uh, and, and like I told, like I said in the beginning, I worked in direct marketing. I never figured out what to do with our hides. Some of the top players in the world, the rock star farmers, have never utilized all of their organ meats, all of their bones, and all of their hides. Like that's a massive problem that has yet to be addressed for the best of the best. Very few white oak pastures in Georgia is probably the furthest along in creating true homes for all of that. And, and even then, they'll be the first to admit we have more to do on that utilization scheme. And so we were like, okay, we're going to connect you with this, this Thousand Hills Grazed, uh, help work with OHP to create that flow through. And Timberland made four boots with it to begin with. I think we've got 11 SKUs with them now, but I think the initial launch was four boots. And really for the first time in modern history, a global brand knew the farmers that grew their leather. They paid the farmers extra for that leather, which most farmers pay a disposal fee on that. Um, and they could tell that story in their marketing. They could they could connect to that with consumers. Uh, and, now, and I wear them all the time. I wear these boots like everywhere because it's, it's such a monumental shift for a company of that scale to pay attention, to care, to put the hard work in. Um, and all of a sudden when we did that, when we got that proof of concept, initially – when we first started Land to Market, you couldn't go to a supply chain partner. You couldn't go to an aggregator, a tannery, a processor, a, a food co-man and have them listen to you. They're like, wait a minute. You want me to do more paper, more segregation? Like, no, no, no. That's not what we do. This is a pennies business. This is a volume business. Like, there's no way we're doing one more thing. They're not going to be the first movers. But they saw what Timberland did and all of a sudden everybody started paying attention. And then the next brand did it and the next brand did it. And then UGG came out and made their big announcement said, we're going hard on this. And all of a sudden, these global supply chains started paying attention. Then they would let us in the door. And so we launched a whole supply chain team. They travel almost nonstop. They're constantly going to processors. We want to build relationships face-to-face -face first. We want, at this stage of our business, as much to be built on relational trust and then affidavits and those pieces afterwards. But, but make sure they understand what it really means to do things differently. And once they let us in the door, it was like, wait a minute, processor. We can, you're the middle, we can help unlock you to a whole world of new raw material producers, of new farmers you didn't know about, connect with, have anything to do with. And we have demand from brands that their, their processor isn't willing to do this. They want to find someone who is. Now we can connect you with new brands at the same time. We can create an unlock for you on both sides. And all of a sudden it was just like, Psh! as soon as we hit those tipping points and broke that ceiling, all of a sudden, all these brands wanted to work with us. Then all the processors wanted to work with us, and it created this this uh, you know deluge, this cascade effect uh, of one to the other. And so that's where we're at today. A huge focus is on those supply chain partners, creating those connections, creating those processes, um, and making sure that we can we can still have scale like we do in a commodity system, but we can hold on to the attributes of what happened at farm and. You know, hopefully this isn't a secret to anybody in American agriculture. The rest of the world's really good at that. Australia's really good at that. New Zealand's really good at that. Uruguay's really good at that. Chile's really good at that. All of our competitors on, you know, the animal agriculture scene, Brazil's really good at that. 
you know, we're over there just being like, no, 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 raw commodity. You don't need the story. And the rest of the world, story is getting baked in and they're creating traceability schemes to track live animal to raw products or crops to raw products into finished goods in ways that we're not really doing a good job of keeping up with. Um, and so so now there's this interest there. There's, there's these supply chain partners going, we want to do this with you. We don't actually see it as an extra hurdle. We see it as an opportunity. And so... That, that middle of the chain is where all the unlocks happening and we're, we're making some real headway there. It's very exciting. That headway. Yeah, it, it seems in- incredible. Um, so th- thanks for sharing those stories and digging into those details of, you know, the supply chain challenges and, and really your team willing, I think some of these deals to happen, right? Like you mentioned, like meeting with people in person and, and really having these conversations, building those relationships. It's awesome. And I think I need a pair of those boots. Um, I'm, in, I'm, in the <laughs> for, uh, I'm in the market for a new pair of farm boots. So uh, I'll, I'll need to uh, circle back with you on the, on the product, but um, Love it. Chris, we're going to kind of bring this conversation issue and close here. I um, want to cover a few questions before we do. What's your ag hot take? I, I really think the role of farmers is, is going to be elevated in the next 10 years. Uh, and maybe this is a little bit of a prediction of the, for the future at the same time. I think we're going to see a data democracy the same way it showed up in many other industries come to agriculture in a way that we've, we've agriculture, we've always kind of been the laggards. We were the last ones to, to enter the industrial age, the last ones to enter the information age. I think this, this, this notion of uh, data democracy is, is coming to us as well. I think we are going to see farmers paid on ecosystem services, uh, but I think it's going to be broader than carbon. Personally, I'd be holding on to my carbon in a silo right now. I would not be selling. And, and that's a tough call. There, I mean, there are people throwing out hundreds of thousands. I've even seen, you know, seven figure contracts for carbon. That's, that's not based on a lot. You know, it's kind of based on one person's model, one little measurement. There's not a lot of statistical relevance there. Um, I think that has an opportunity to really hurt the movement more than help it. You get a couple of exposés of like, this doesn't have a lot of weight to it that can really kind of move us backwards. But regardless of that, there's going to be some ups and downs. I compare this regenerative movement a lot to like early dot com. I think there's going to be some boom and bust. I think there's going to be some fallout. Um, you know, we want to be, we want to be, you know, kind of the Amazon in that world that's, that's building itself from day one to kind of weather those booms and bust. Uh, we're certainly in a boom period now. We'll see if this if this lasts forever and kind of what comes through the other side as people realize what it means to really roll up your sleeves and do the hard work and change the way business is done. This isn't, I often say this isn't pixie dust. We're not sprinkling pixie dust on this. This is real work, real innovation, uh, and a real change in strategy. And if you're that company that's like, hey, our old model was extractive and we are screwing up and we're not part of the solution and we want to be part of the solution – Show up to the table and do the hard work. If you're not there yet, this probably isn't for you because it isn't just a, a, a it's not a turnkey solution that you're just going to change this one or two things um, and get there. So I think our culture is under this paradigm shift. A ton is about to change coming down the pipeline. Uh, I think for for most more producers than society realizes, that's a really good thing because I think for a long time, producers have been doing the right thing because they care. They care about the legacy of what they pass on to their kids. They care about just healing the environment in general, but there's been no mechanism in the marketplace to recognize that. So I think that's all coming, uh, but I do think we're in this wild west phase right now of trying to figure out what that looks like. And I think we're going to be in a future where brands know who their farmers are and that, and that idea of a rock star farmer. We've got two or three of them here in the U.S., um, I think that's going to be kind of like what Spotify did for music. All of a sudden, all these indie bands show up and everybody's kind of got their favorites. I think we're going to see that as well. We're going to see the, a, a democracy of that as well. And there's going to be a whole cohort of well-known players and fewer and fewer rock stars. And it's going to get to be a, a larger middle of people that are recognizable and, and kind of known for doing the right thing. Um, so I think most of the changes coming are pretty exciting. Uh, I think we, we will have to all kind of like stay resolute that there's some wild stuff happening right now. There'll be some ups and downs in that. And we'll, uh, we'll weather our way through that together. Um, but it's an exciting time for sure. Love that. Well, as we wrap up, Chris, what's saving your life right now? I'll say, okay, so the first one that comes to mind, and maybe it's not the right one, but not traveling during COVID was a bit of a lifesaver because all of a sudden everyone realized, hey, we can still create connections just like we're looking at each other right now. You know, we can still create connections uh, virtually here. And so to create 
a true globalized program, you know, even as our team is growing rapidly, we're just 12 people, the ability to be able to build relationships virtually uh, as much as we all complained about it during COVID, I get it. I mean, I've got as much Zoom fatigue as anybody. Um, but it really is allowing us to do things that we weren't able to do before. And to have all of society kind of lifted up by that is is um, kind of all come to that conclusion at the same time is pretty cool. Um, so now we can do a ton of deals that we couldn't do before virtually. What else is saving my life right now? I don't know. I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty uh, voracious person reader. I'm really into this book right now called Reinventing Organizations and this idea of kind of the new paradigm shift that's happening in human organization and culture and how we collectively decide to show up together and work together um, and how that's getting flatter and more circular. And that can be scary to kind of our old ideas of hierarchy, but doesn't need to be. So yeah, that's another one. The, the Reinventing Organizations by, by Lalu, a French philosopher guy that's been focused on human organization for a long time. So it's another one that comes to mind. Well, Chris, this has been a ton of fun. As we finish up, how can listeners get in touch and uh, and connect with you and everything you're doing at Land of Market? Yeah, the best place is probably landofmarket.com. You can, you can search me out on LinkedIn as well, uh, Chris Kirsten. Um, I'm fairly active on LinkedIn. But, uh, but landofmarket.com is going to be kind of our clearinghouse for everything. Uh, we've got a newsletter there that people can sign up for if they want to. And that's just kind of where new information about brands and things are coming out all the time, what products to buy. Uh, we're building out those catalogs as that product set gets bigger and bigger and bigger. We're building out more tools to help um, all the players along the supply chain, including the consumers, find those materials and, and see what's available to them as they want to create their own change in their own lives and their own businesses. Um, so, yeah, that's the best place to go. Awesome. Thanks so much for being with us, Chris. All right. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tyler. I appreciate it. Hi, we came out of the gates hot in 2023 with this interview with Chris. What do you think? I thought it was just just awesome. I mean, it, it gets me fired up just about regenerative agriculture. And it's a lot of what we talk on this podcast. Not only do we need, you know, more farmers transitioning, but really it's also about the supply chain, the 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 processing, the infrastructure, the brands, how we connect all those things. Um, Chris is one of you know, a few people out there that are really making deals happen and helping bring farmers and brands together. And that is like not a trivial thing at all as, you know, as someone who's tried to work on these deals, right, in the past. So it just gets me fired up that they're they're really grinding and making a lot of impact with huge, huge brands in the space and especially with the focus on apparel and animal agriculture. And I just think it's it's super inspiring what they're doing. Totally. Well, Ty, with your payout from your sports betting, maybe we can buy some uh, Timberland regenerative boots for for us when we go to the farm. That'd be good. Tim and I were scoping out the uh, the Timberland boots after this uh, conversation because I definitely feel like I could use a new pair of farm boots and keep myself, you know, at a distance from the dirt that uh, that it steps on. Totally. Well, guys, hope you really enjoyed this interview. Um, we, we hope you found it as informative as we did. We'll be in touch next week with another good interview. Mm-hmm.